Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. Okay, today we're going to start with the first of a two-part series dealing with a key prophecy about the end times. Let's get started. It was an incredibly special day, unlike any other. After approximately three years of public ministry, Jesus was approaching Jerusalem on his father's schedule. Quite some time earlier, after miraculously feeding between five and 15,000 people with only five loaves and two fish, that's in John 6, they had wanted to make him their king, but at that point, Jesus split the scene. You see, it wasn't time yet. However, now, As he rode down the slope of the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey's colt, you can see Zechariah 9, 9 to see more on that, the followers began shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. And this time Jesus was really into it. You see, this was the day, literally the set time. True to form, the religious leaders nearby wanted Jesus to shut them up, to zip their lips. They said, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Jesus responded, quote, If these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. What? Was Jesus being a bit enthusiastic here? Perhaps euphemistic. Was this just some Middle Eastern saying of the time? Now, I don't know about you, but... I've never heard stones talk. And yet Jesus, the one who commanded the winds and the sea, indeed was being literal here. Obviously, the moment was very, very special. And the pronouncement of his arrival as the king was absolutely going to be made. But why? Well, Jesus gave us the clue. As he drew near to the city, he wept. And that word literally means to sob or wail. In verses 42 through 44, he said, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time, literally the set time, of your visitation. Now the word day in verse 42 there most frequently means daylight period, which makes sense, for Jesus claimed that while he was in the world, he was the light of the world. It's John 9, 5. And the word time there in verse 44 literally means a set time, as in a time previously established. Now what Jesus was claiming in all of this was that this was a day, a set time, which was foretold prophetically. It was a day and a situation that they could have recognized had it not been hidden from them. He mentioned a set time or my time in other scriptures as well. See John 7, 6, and 30. And some astute disciple might have asked, Lord, what's so special about March 30th, 33 A.D.? And that would have been especially astute, seeing as they didn't use a Julian calendar then. But to answer this, Jesus would have taken him to a portion of Scripture in Daniel that we know as chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. It says, beginning with verse 24, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish the transgression." to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand 
that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. And verse 26, And after sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. In this passage, the word translated as weeks is literally sevens. So the prophecy starts with a declaration that seventy sevens have been determined or pre-established in which several awesome things will be accomplished. Note also that these sevens are set specifically for two things, the Jewish people and Jerusalem. So, what are these awesome things? First, he says, quote, to finish the transgression, or literally the rebellion or breakaway. You see, mankind broke away from God back in the Garden of Eden, and the Lord said that within this period of the prophecy, the rift would be healed. Mankind, including the Jewish people, would be reconciled with our loving Creator. The revolt ended, the rift healed. But for this to happen, the next promised occurrence had to take place, quote, to make an end of sins, or literally offenses and their penalties. You see, all of man's offenses before a just and holy God had to be paid for, all past, present, and future offenses. And furthermore, the slate had to be wiped clean so the true reconciliation of man with God could take place. That is, not only would all offenses and their penalties be satisfied, but it would be as if they never occurred in the first place, quote, to make reconciliation for iniquity. Then he added the kicker. Not only would the rift be bridged, offenses and penalties ended, and reconciliation produced, but then the perfect future is guaranteed. For he said that everlasting righteousness would be brought in, eternal righteousness in everyone and everything. Wow. Finally, he said that vision and prophecy would be sealed or closed up, and that the most holy would be anointed. So, what was revealed in this passage is clearly the grand and glorious plan of God, and the timepiece, so to speak, for it is also made obvious, the Jews and Jerusalem. Like two hands on a clock, they're ticking off sevens, seventy sevens, or four hundred and ninety. But four hundred and ninety what? Well, we'll see that it is referring to 490 years. Verse 25 gives more detail. Specifically, the passage says that from the going forth, or issuance of a decree, to restore and build Jerusalem, and notably the wall of the city, until the coming of Messiah the Prince, that is, Messiah hailed as royalty, or in the line of David, would be a total of seven plus sixty-two, or sixty-nine sevens, which is four hundred and eighty-three years. Then, verse 26 adds that after this period, the Messiah would be cut off or killed, but not for himself. Whew. This prophecy is so explicit in its schedule. Only God could pull it off. You see, just as Daniel predicted, the command which allowed the Jews to restore Jerusalem and specifically to rebuild the wall was given March 5th, 444 B.C. by Artaxerxes Longabanus to Nehemiah. Other similar decrees were given, but this one included the rebuilding of the wall, that is, restoring the city's defenses, as mentioned in the prophecy. We arrive at this date by looking at Nehemiah 1.1 and 2.1, and then knowing that Artaxerxes succeeded his father Xerxes immediately after his death, that's around December 17th, 465 B.C., and had a year, what they called a year of ascension, 
before his own reign began. And thus we come to Nisan in the Hebrew calendar, Nisan 1, 444 B.C., which in our calendar corresponded to March 5th. Now, we're going to do a little arithmetic, so hang with me. Although the total period outlined in the passage was 77s, or 490 years, the declaring of the Messiah as king was pinpointed as being after the 62 sevens, which are listed after the first seven sevens. Therefore, this put it at 7 plus 62, or 69 sevens. That equals 483 years. Got it? Also, we must use the 360-day calendar, not like ours, 365 and you know what, but use the 360-day calendar for each year. This was the calendar of their day, the calendar originally used as shown in the Genesis account of Noah's flood. We can call it the prophetic year, if you would. So, if each year holds 360 days, and we want to measure out a a span of time equaling 483 of those years, well, it's the same as, get this, 173, 880 days. So, what's the big deal? Well, here it comes. Now, beginning with March 5th, 444 B.C., if we proceed forward 173,880 days, accounting for, in that period, 116 of leap years, only one year between 1 B.C. and 1 A.D., and a couple other slight imperfections in our own calendar, we come to Monday, March 30th, 33 A.D. exactly. And there, indeed, we find Jesus riding on the donkey, entering Jerusalem, hailed as the Son of David, that is, Messiah, the Prince. Of course the rocks would have cried out. This prophecy is so stunningly accurate that numerous critics have tried to disprove it, but honest and thorough historical, theological, and archaeological research has indeed validated it. As if God's word needed validation. But Jesus wept, for the people could have known if they had not been blinded. And just as Daniel foretold, Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. Jesus laid down his life freely on the crucifix of Calvary the following Friday, April 3rd, 33 AD, but not for himself. You see, he was sinless, the spotless Lamb of God, and he was cut off for us. Now, although Jesus said, No man would know the day or hour of his coming to rapture the church, to take us into heaven, as seen in the parable of the five wise virgins in Matthew 25. He also gave us many prophetic indicators. Paul wrote, You are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief, or catch you unawares. So, may we not repeat the blindness of his people, Concerning his coming as Messiah the Prince, he told us to watch, to be discerning of the signs of the times, and to eagerly wait for his appearing. As for Israel, Messiah the Savior is yet to be recognized. But we know from Romans 11.25 that this will happen. So, there's one seven left out of the seventy. Lord willing... We'll look at that in our next podcast. God bless you as you seek to welcome the coming of our Savior King. Now may the Lord grant you peace in the midst of any storm and faith to trust Him. Look for our next podcast and may you realize more of His grace today.